So I want to talk to you this evening about the rule of law. That's one of the most evocative phrases we have in our lexicon. It is, we say, one of the things that makes Canada one of the most desirable countries in all the world in which to live. But I'm going to suggest to you that the rule of law as we know it, the rule of law as we cherish it, is not compatible with the technological era that we're living in today. Now, I'm not meaning to paint a doomsday scenario or anything like that, but I do think that if we don't supplement the rule of law to take account of how the world has changed, then it's not going to be able to do what we want and need it to do. In fact, if, I think that if we don't supplement or augment our understanding of the rule of law, then increasingly it will become a toothless tiger. It will become little more than a political slogan. And I'm going to offer a suggestion that may sound counterintuitive, may seem controversial to some of you. And that is that the rule of law, the survival of the rule of law as we know it, depends upon big multinational corporations. Now that may have startled you, so let me say that, let me say that again. The survival of the rule of law as we know it depends upon the support of big multinational corporations. Now, that may seem a tall order in light of some of the egregious examples of bad corporate behavior that we read about. And I'm not going to deny any of that. I'm not going to paint a Pollyanna-ish view of, 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 the, of corporate culture. But I do think that unless we're willing to reconceive how we think about corporate power, it's going to be very difficult to preserve many of the values that we hold dear in our society. And at the risk of sounding hopelessly naive, I think that that can happen. And that's what I want to talk to you about this evening. I want to challenge how you reflexively think about the way in which we protect rights in Canada and in the Western world today. But let's start at the beginning. What do we mean by the rule of law? We use the expression all the time, but what do we mean by it? Well, the truth is that we can't define it particularly precisely. And if you want a, a living example of that, just look at the political debates that are taking place in the United States today. There are overlapping and different points of conflict, but both sides, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, left, right, whichever label you want to use, both sides are claiming the rule of law as a justification for their positions. And that's one of the funny things about the rule of law. That when we make a claim about something, and when we base that claim on the rule of law, we assume that that's the end of the argument, that the other side has no option um, but, to, but to concede. Um, it's, it's kind of the ultimate way of putting the expression in your face, sucker, in constitutional terms. <clears throat> uh, but at base, the rule of law, as we understand it in the West, is about government accountability. It's a way of saying that there are rules and procedures that governments have to follow if they want to exercise their power. Even popularly elected governments have to follow before they can exercise their power. The problem, though, is that it's based upon, uh, the rule of law is based upon um, a, a system of national governance. The ultimate guarantor of the rule of law, as we understand it, is the courts. We say that a country governed by the rule of law means that the government and everyone who works for the government has to obey the law just like we all do as, as private citizens. And if we don't, then we can be taken to court. So it's a way of protecting us by regulating and controlling the exercise of government power. The problem is that the world in which we live today is increasing, increasingly a world in which power is not susceptible to government control. This is a picture of my great, my great grandmother. It was taken in 1907 when she just gotten engaged to be married. In fact, you can see the ring that she's wearing proudly on her, 
on her finger. Uh, this was a woman I knew, I knew well in my childhood. And uh, amazingly, she lived to see men walk on the moon. But when this photograph was taken, she'd never seen an airplane. And living in rural New Brunswick, she'd seen automobiles maybe a handful of times. The Kaiser and the Tsar were still on their thrones, and Britain ruled a quarter of humanity. Uh, hers was, in other words, a world of constancy. Now, we now know that just a few years later, we came close to collectively blowing our brains out in the First World War, but to a young woman living in Westmoreland County, New Brunswick in 1907, the world seemed about as stable as stable could be. To be sure, there was uncertainty in her life, but that uncertainty in a farming community was Mother Nature. As far as government was concerned, all was constant. Now, she wouldn't have spoken this way, but the lodestone of that constancy was the rule of law. It was an unstated yet indelible part of the fabric of life. But that couldn't be more different than the world in which we live today. Globalization is an overused term, and it's become politically charged. It's blamed for a lot of things today. We know that unease about globalization has become a dominant factor in political discourse in both the United States in Great Britain, and in many other parts of the world as well. We know that the future of the North American tr Free Trade Agreement partly depends upon unease uh, about the, uh, the nature of, of globalization. Um, but the essence of it, it seems to me, is not going away. Uh, the essence of globalization as reflecting our increasing interconnectedness as a result of the transportation and the technological revolutions, that's with us to stay. And I think that's probably a good thing. I mean, for one thing, it gives us access to a much broader range of, of, uh, of opportunities than was the case before, and that ranges from the mundane, like buying groceries, to the uplifting, like exposure to culture, uh, music, art, uh, art and, and literature. Thanks to globalization, less wealthy countries are finding it easier to sell their products to more wealthy countries, which means that as we speak, the global level of poverty is decreasing at a significant, at a significant rate. And if you believe in capitalism, it follows that a free market in goods and services encourages competition, and that encourages efficiency, and that discourages waste. So how could that be a bad thing? But even if you don't buy into the idea of globalization as a political philosophy, I don't imagine that many of us can seriously contemplate a return to a life without the smartphone and the internet. But both of those things are creatures of and engines driving globalization. But there's a paradox, and that is that the more global, or international if you prefer, we are, the less possible it is for a national legal system, a national government working with a national court system to protect our rights. My great-grandmother's life was largely local. The clothes she wore, the things she bought, were almost all produced in the maritime provinces. And she was onto this 100-mile diet thing long before it was trendy, I can, I can, I can tell you that. Um, well, how different our lives are today. Um, my weekly grocery bill uh, includes vegetables from the United States uh, and Mexico, uh, fruit from the West Indies and Central America. None of the clothes I wear were made in Alberta and very few in Canada. Uh, the automobile I drive was manufactured by a Korean company and across the border multiple times in the course of its production. The electronics I use with, with increasing frequency as I become more engaged with the so-called Internet of Things all contain components from multiple continents. So what does this mean? 
what does this mean for the rule of law? What does it mean for the rule of law in the 21st century? Well, if her life was largely local, so too were the threats to my great-grandmother's life. People could harm her or, or her family. People could steal her possessions or destroy her possessions. If, heaven forbid, since she was my great-grandmother, she broke the law herself, then she could be punished by the local courts. Well, all of those things can still happen today. But because of our interconnectedness, we face threats today that were inconceivable to the Canadian of 1907. And chief among these, of course, is the threat to our privacy. That's what the controversy about data mining is all about. And because so many of our products um, are the result of global supply chains, that means that the protection of workers' rights, the protection of human rights, depends upon things that happen in other countries. But here's the rub. The only entity that is capable of exercising real global influence in a direct day-to-day -day fashion is the global multinational corporation. Now that will seem like an odd thing to say. Surely, many of you are thinking, a big, powerful country like the United States or a multilateral entity like the European Union, surely they can exercise global influence. Well, of course they can, but they can't do so directly, and they can't do so nimbly. If the United States wants something to happen in another country, it has to ask, and failing that, it has to exert pressure. And that's because in a direct sense, American legal authority ends at the American border. But global corporations aren't limited in the same way, and that's because they're alive in multiple countries at once. And what that means is that global corporate leadership can exercise influence directly, immediately, and across borders in a way that no country can. And if you think about it, what that means is that we actually have a double-edged sword. On one hand, corporations, global corporations, are increasingly beyond the control the effective control of national governments. On the other, because of the nature of interconnectedness, it is only global corporations that can respond effectively and immediately and nimbly to important rule of law issues. In 2003, there was a documentary film made called simply The, the Corporation, and it was a huge hit. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen it. This is a poster for it in Italian. The, 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 the corporation argued that the nature of the modern business corporation meant that it, they were all inevitably uh, psychopathic, pursuing profit at the expense of everything else. And heaven knows that there are plenty of examples of that throughout history. But history also gives us illustrations of corporations acting in the social good, even when that hasn't profited them in the short term. And let me give you one example of that, an example that's close to home to me professionally. Walmart is not often held up as a model corporate citizen. But the fact is that Walmart has done more to promote diversity in the legal profession than almost anyone else, and certainly more than any government in Canada has ever done. And that's because in 2005, Walmart wrote to all of its major legal suppliers worldwide and said that we won't use you anymore unless you can demonstrate a meaningful commitment to diversity. And that was a huge moment in my professional world. And its effects reverberate even today. So if corporations can exercise their power for good or for bad, the question then becomes, what will cause them to exercise their influence, their power, in a positive way? How do we make corporations want to be part of the solution 
rather than part of the problem? How do we animate corporations with the spirit of the rule of law? How do we, to, to use a movie title, how do we make them want to do the right thing? Well, the instinct, the reflexive instinct is to say, we'll pass laws to regulate them. You know, if you want to do business in Canada, you have to meet the following standards. Well, that can help. But for a global company with global supply chains, it can only help so much. Moreover, you know, we say that knowledge is power. Well, the fact is that global corporations, particularly global tech corporations, know an awful lot about us. And that gives them an awful lot of power over us, power that's by its very nature is not easily controlled by governments. And that's because information doesn't instinctively ref respect national borders. Uh, the great democratic battles of the 19th and 20th centuries were about making the franchise, the right to vote, universal. Because a right to vote means a right to be taken seriously by the government. The great democratic battle in the 21st century, in my view, has to be about the corporate franchise. We live in the global era, the technological era, the digital era. And in that era, the corporate franchise is just as critical as the democratic franchise. In fact, I think you could argue that if we don't have a corporate franchise, we don't have much of a meaningful franchise at all. We don't have much of a meaningful voice at all if we don't have the corporate franchise. Political empowerment in the 21st century has to mean much more than it meant in the 19th and 20th centuries. So here's the point. In my great-grandmother's time, the government had a duty to protect our rights. And the courts were the guarantor of that duty. And that worked because the threats to the rule of law were mostly local. The threats we face today, the gravest threats that we face today to the rule of law, are all ones that aren't easily susceptible to national control. So the challenge is this, how do we preserve values that we hold dear? How do we preserve values that we say are core to our way of life when the traditional enforcement mechanisms just can't do the job? Put another way, how can we get corporations to accept their role as 21st century co-guarantors of the rule of law. It's the same functional question, question about the accountability of power that underlies the traditional understanding of the rule of law. How do we get corporations to accept their role as co-guarantors? And that's not a lawyer's question. It's a society question. It's a citizen's question. It's a question that we all own. It's a question that we all have to answer together because our liberty, our freedom, the very rule of law depend on it. Thank you.